Thrive Friends, this is your host, Dr. Solomon. Today, I'm joined by a special guest, Christian Bush. Christian is a fellow professional colleague, and his accolades are just so numerous. He is a top 30 emerging management thinkers globally. He's a member of the World Economic Expert Forum. His new book, The Serendipity Mindset, has been highly recommended by the HuffPost as, quote, life-changing book. Christian is also a professor at NYU and a visiting professor at London School of Economics. Christian Bush, welcome on Thrive. Thanks so much for having me. Truly excited to have you as a guest today. Christian, you did your master's and PhD at the London School of Economics, and you are pursuing an academic career at NYU now and still in touch with LSC. I'm curious about your journey to the advisory role for executives. How did this come by? Yeah, it's really something, you know, since I've been 18 years old, I've been on a kind of intense search for meaning, trying to figure out what is something that really kind of uh, is impactful in the world. And I've tried out different platforms. You know, I started out as an entrepreneur, then social entrepreneur, and then went more into business. And one of the things I've realized is that, you know, whenever we were building things, or whenever I was kind of, you know, coordinating around uh, businesses and so on, uh, it always felt we're reinventing the wheel. It always felt, well, there, there has to be more to that. And so I kind of dove deeper into academia to try to understand what is the evidence behind, you know, success and failure? What is the evidence behind how we create social environmental impact and, and, and how we don't? And so it's really kind of in a way that inner curiosity of saying, how do we really understand what things such as impact mean? And how do we then take that into companies and into, into communities and so on? And so it's really kind of, um, I've always loved this idea of, of bridging between different areas um, and kind of having navigated through different areas, I feel like academia has become a beautiful home because it allows to focus on generating really interesting insights and ideas, but at the same time, you know, then kind of working with people in business to really say, okay, how do we um, now put that into practice again, but also then, you know, make that really kind of this learning circle and, and really uh, learn from each other and, um, you know, implement that. And I think especially in a fast changing world, nothing is more important than kind of to try to understand what is it that we know already and what is it that kind of we have to learn along the way and then implement that. I totally agree with you. And you clearly are a man who are wearing many hats. So this brings me to the question, how do you go about dividing your time? You are a writer, you are a teacher, you are a coach, you are a director of the Global Economy Unit at NYU. How do you go about not only dividing your time, but the decision about allocating your time between all these different practices? It's a great question. It's something, you know, that, that has kind of been a challenge, uh, you know, over the years. And I think one of the things that, that shaped my work mostly is, is this idea of maker versus manager schedule and saying, you know, I try to block in the morning time where I completely focus on content, on like conceptual thinking, on strategy, on the big things where you need two or three hours of kind of uninterrupted time. And so I, I literally schedule a meeting with myself then, so nobody gets that meeting. And then essentially kind of the meeting, meeting, meeting stuff and, and, and other things. And I feel like by doing this, what happens is that you very consciously in a way, you know, when you, if you would map it in kind of like important urgent kind of categories, a lot of times, you know, we get into the urgency, but not so important stuff all the time, because that's, you know, what's on top of our inbox and, and so on. And so it's kind of like the typical manager schedule where you're a lot of times kind of reactive or you're kind of, you know, managing fires and things like that. It's a lot of times urgent, urgent, but in the long run, when you look back in five years, it might not be the most important. And so it's really kind of the morning, the two, three hours are really the kind of important ones that are not as urgent. Um, and then essentially the rest of the day is like, okay, let's kind of work on the things that are urgent. And, uh, and sometimes, of course, that the urgent and important things, but um, it's really kind of that differentiation where then um, the mornings are for the more academic work and conceptual work and then the afternoons for, you know, the, the rest of the work. And I feel what it did in terms of well-being also is, you know, I realized that if you, if you, if you, if you put them together too much, then it gets frustrating because if you try mm -hmm. to dive into, you know, conceptual work where it takes you like 10 minutes to get into it and then someone comes for a quick coffee, you know, it takes you so much time to get back into it and then you feel you were unproductive versus, you know, safeguarding that time and then pushing all the meetings uh, into, into the day later um, allows to also feel more productive and, and to, you know, when you look back at the end of the month, you're like, oh, actually there were a couple of things I really got done versus I was just kind of fighting fires. I love these thoughts. It reminds me of uh, Eisenhower's matrix of the important and the urgent 
and the different quadrants. And the quadrant two is the one that usually important, but not urgent, but somehow this quadrant tends to be shifted or lost in the middle of the quarter one, which is everything that's urgent. Also, well, the idea of having a block to meet with the self, I don't think this is something that we are good at. And we, by we, I mean people who are working the professional world. We usually have a block to meet with someone else, but not with ourselves. And before we move on, I'd like to ask people watching us to open a new tab and look up the serendipitymindset.com and then click on tweets to check the latest updates about Christian's work. Time to chat about your new book, Christian. I looked up the definition of serendipity in the Oxford Dictionary and is defined as the occurrence and development of events by chance in a happy or beneficial way and an underline by chance. In your book though, Serendipity Mindset, you suggest that serendipity is not a passive process that happens to us. If anything, we can, I'll quote you, attract the unexpected or another quote, cultivate serendipity. So how could we reconcile this discrepancy between the classic definition and your definition of uh, serendipity? Yeah, that's a great question because that's essentially how we, you know, a lot of times when we think about serendipity, we think about something that just happens to us, right? It's passive, mm -hmm. it just happens to a couple of people and that's that. Um, but, you know, serendipity in a way, when you go back to the original idea of it, where, you know, if you look back into the kind of history books of when the princes of serendip were traveling and, you know, it was all about essentially they made these, you know, accidental discoveries, but they had to make sense out of it. They had to have sagacity, mm -hmm. they had to have wisdom or curiosity to essentially connect dots and, and do something with it. And so that's really kind of why serendipity in its ori original idea, but also in, in, in the research we've been doing and the kind of the latest research that's, that's out there in general, serendipity is really not about this kind of blind luck, you know, which just happens to us, you know, being born into a good family or, you know, inheriting something or stuff like this is things that just happens to us passively. But serendipity is about the process of spotting something, of seeing something that is unexpected, that is random, that's chance, but then also doing something with it and, and connecting the dots. And so at the end of the day, then the beautiful thing of CERN or about serendipity is that we can both make meaningful, like make accidents more meaningful. So, you know, if you think about something like Viagra, right, where, you know, accidentally, yeah. like there was some kind of movement in male participants' trousers. And instead of ignoring this, they said when they were, you know, kind of giving people a medication against uh, angina, you know, they saw some kind of like movement in male participants trousers. And it was about their sagacity, it was about their wisdom to see something in the moment and say, Oh, my God, a lot of men in the world might have a problem around this, let's turn this into a product. And so that is how serendipity happens a lot of times, right, that something goes wrong. In the case of penicillin, it would be kind of spilled uh, substances. And in other cases, it's, you know, some kind of accident that happens. But then we have to do something with it. We have to see an opportunity in it. We have to make an accident meaningful. But also, you know, that is kind of the more how we deal with crises and accidents, especially at the moment. But also then we can create more meaningful accidents. And that's where it gets really exciting. Because that's where essentially we can, by the way we ask questions, by the way we have rituals and companies, we can essentially create meaningful accidents. So, you know, to give you like a simple example, there's this amazing entrepreneur in London, Oli Barrett. And if you would ask him something like, um, what do you do? You know, this old question that puts us into mm -hmm. a box and that we hear at every conference and, and at every call with a new person, he would say something like, you know what, I am a technology entrepreneur or an education entrepreneur, but what I really enjoy is the philosophy of science and I recently started playing the piano. What he's doing mm -hmm. here is he's giving you three hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. I'm hosting piano matinees, you should come by. Or, oh my God, such a coincidence, my brother is teaching the philosophy of science, I should put you in touch. The point is that we can use every conversation, every interaction to see the couple of dots that other people can connect for us. And that's really what serendipity then is about. It's about seeing and connecting dots. And the more we can also have other people connect the dots for us, we can essentially develop this beautiful kind of acceleration of, of serendipity. This is wonderful. It reminds me of a quote by Louis Pasteur, luck serves the prepared mind. Exactly, exactly. Um, so on this point, Christian, how could we make our own luck during times of uncertainty or unexpected crises? Yeah, 
Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I'm a big fan of the, the hook strategy that I just mentioned. So mm -hmm. literally every conversation, trying to seed some kind of information. I'm a big fan of making a serendipity journal. So thinking about mm -hmm. what were the times in our life when we reflect on it, where something we where we did something with the unexpected that went to something towards something good versus something where nothing happens. So understanding what holds us back. So for example, um, imagine the situation, you know, you're in a coffee shop and if you have erratic hand movements like I do, uh, you know, you spill coffee all the time. And so imagine you spill coffee over someone in the coffee shop and you sense there might be some kind of connection. You sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is, of course, but you, you know, and now you have two options. Option number one is you just say, I'm so sorry, here's a napkin. You walk outside and then you think, oh, I should have talked with this person, right? Mm -hmm. So this feeling of, ah, what could have happened? Versus mm -hmm. option number two, you're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was in my head thinking about X, Y, Z. And then maybe that's kind of your co-founder that comes out of it or your love interest or your business partner. Partner. So the point is, if we reflect on these kind of questions in our serendipity journal, we can see the patterns behind how we tend to act on the unexpected, how we tend to act in situations where we sense there could be something where we don't do it. And then we can dive deeper and say, what is it behind that? Is there the mm -hmm. imposter syndrome that takes over? I can see the potential opportunity, but I don't act on it because I don't feel worthy or I don't feel X, Y, Z. And so I'm a big fan of, of really also first working on what holds us back from opportunity and then dive into the practices such as the hook strategy. There's a lot of other strategies that are that are kind of like, you know, um, very pragmatic, but also for companies, you know, we can mm -hmm. we can use things. I'm a big fan of the um, of the project funeral or the postmortem where, you know, usually in companies when something doesn't work out or even in families or other kind of mm -hmm. groups, right, in communities, when something doesn't work out, we don't want to be the loser, right? We don't want to be mm -hmm. the one who messed something up. So we try to hide it. So we don't talk mm -hmm. about it. So the problem is we don't really learn from each other that much because the real learning, of course, comes from something that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you use a project funeral, the idea is that the person who's responsible for it lays it to rest in front of people from other kind of divisions in this case, and then essentially says, this is what we learn from it. So it's not about celebrating failure, it's about celebrating the learning from what didn't work. And so in this one case, you know, they had this, um, <laughs> this company that produced um, like window glass, window frames, and the idea was that the light wouldn't reflect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's an amazing technology, but they said, look, we learned that um, the market is not big enough to really make a lot of money with it. So they laid it to rest. Now, someone in the audience goes like, hey, hey, have you considered what this would mean for solar? Have you considered if we would take that technology and put it into a solar device, like how much energy that could absorb? And that is, quote unquote, coincidentally, how part of their solar division emerged. You know, nobody saw it coming. Nobody, by definition, can know what the unexpected outcome is. But they created a process that makes it more likely that some kind of positive outcome happens. And so I'm a big fan of these kind of rituals or practices or even small things, you know, in meeting from time to time asking what surprised you last week. Was there anything that was against what we expected? And once you do that, you, you essentially legitimize the idea that there's always something unexpected in the data that can potentially help us to come to the coolest things. And so, you know, that's essentially how most innovations and inventions emerge, right? That people see something in the unexpected and then do something with it. And there's a lot of examples. I mean, if we have more time later, we can talk about, for example, the potato washing machine, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> and how about individual levels? So you mentioned the coffee example, but say someone got laid off because of the pandemic or any other economic uh, trouble. How can they use serendipity in, in a situation like this? Well, one thing I've seen a lot with my, with my students here is that, you know, they had their careers mapped out, they had their next job mapped out, they had their internship mapped out, and then COVID happened and, you know, it all kind of fell through. And one of the things we've done is to say, okay, can you set serendipity bombs? So can you essentially, even in a period where not a lot of people hire, how can you put yourself on the radar in a way that whenever someone will hire, that they are thinking of you? So, for example, can you write to 20 second degree contacts on LinkedIn, um, you know, who somehow inspired you, right? Because obviously, mm -hmm. you know, the beautiful thing about platforms like LinkedIn is you can get to second degree contacts via email and you can essentially reach like so many people, you, you know, as a student, like who doesn't have a lot of contacts, 
and you know two associate professors you know via them you have so many second degree contacts so now the idea is to say okay like looking at the at the person who has like potentially a job at some point and saying i've been so inspired by you and like a really genuine kind of you know message in terms of saying hey i've been inspired by you i've been exploring xyz just wanted to reach out and xyz you do that 20 times right in a non-pitchy way and like two or three people are like oh my god like mm -hmm. you know we've been thinking about exploring xyz we don't hire at the moment but i'll get back to xyz the point here is that by putting ourselves on the radar of people that is then when in two or three or four or five months now the first people are coming and saying hey wasn't there this xyz student who was reaching out about xyz i'm currently hiring for xyz the point here is that essentially the more we can set these different bombs that could go off at a later point the better in those periods where you know like we we we, we, we both like we hustle right i mean i remember when i like one of my first companies we essentially it came out of like financial crises where you know we 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 were building this kind of uh, essentially a community based incubator a wonderful community around it and we wanted to do it first as a conference and then you know financial crisis hit and we had to completely scrap it because the sponsors jumped ship and then essentially it was an amazing opportunity to just rethink everything and to say you know what actually maybe we shouldn't do it a big event but we should do like local small events and then build the community more organically and that turned out to be the best thing to build a close-knit community the point here is that you know bad luck in the short run a lot of times can actually turn into good luck when you know we use it maybe to like like look inward and say maybe there's other areas or industries we could like go into afterwards maybe i can for the first time question now my career track or mm -hmm. if i if i could do something completely different but also like again coming back to the idea of the serendipity journal to go back and say what is it really that my core interests are what is it really the kind of areas i'm really interested in and how can i reach out to people and seed those dots now so that then essentially a lot of times you know jobs get co-created nowadays, right? It's not that just someone mm -hmm. kind of says, here's a job description, like apply to it, but it's essentially where you're seeding what you're excited about. And then someone says, you know what? We just wanted to do X, Y, Z. Like, let's, let me put you in touch with the person who's doing it. The point here is like, it's really about um, also what we talked about earlier. The more we can, you know, cast our hooks and and, and, and put our bombs out there, um, the better for for things that can can happen. I think in the immediate, um, in, the, in the immediate moment, one thing I've seen, work really well is to consider every conversation as a conversation where there could be something in there, even with an old friend, right? Mm -hmm. If we talk with an old friend, a lot of times clients come from the stepmom of the brother's sister's friend you know what i mean like it's kind of like it's completely unexpected places where a new client comes from yeah. but if we don't tell people about it if we don't if you don't tell people about hey i'm currently looking into xyz like you know just in case you hear something like we have to put it out there and so i think it's really about putting out there what are we looking for sharing that with people and then a lot of times essentially you know in a non-pitchy way if we do it in a non-pitchy way and people really want to help us that's how a lot of things emerge and i've seen that in my own life how a lot of times in those toughest periods that's where from the most unexpected corners something happens if we really do that kind of seeding seeding things out there i couldn't agree more with you life is really unexpected by definition uh, for our audience if you are enjoying this conversation please click like and subscribe to the youtube channel and share the link on your social the media unexpected. and why not follow me by on definition my social media at dr solomon md christian this is a question i ask every guest on thrive we all had setbacks where we picked ourselves up and managed to thrive would you mind sharing a setback of yours and how did you overcome it yeah, I feel like in my life, so I've had a couple of near-death experiences in my life, and I think mm -hmm. those were usually the experiences where I, in a way, found a lot of meaning in them. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations, you know, with people who have faced death or who have had near-death experiences, and that question of how do we frame it? Do we let this event define us, or do we try to reframe that event into something that, that we have some kind of agency in? And <clears throat> I remember, for example, um, so I had a severe form of COVID earlier in the year, and I remember, um, you know, like I couldn't really breathe. I was like in a very, very kind of, um, you know, like, uh, yeah, in a, in a rough state. And, and I remember I reread uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning book. And, you know, I mean, Viktor Frankl survived the Holocaust. Like he was in the concentration camp. Like this is the toughest of situations you can imagine. And still he found meaning in it where he said like, okay, you know, things such as every day I will still speak with one person 
um, here in the camps. And by doing this, I make them feel better. And because I make them feel better, there's some kind of meaning for me still here. And I've seen that with a lot of friends during COVID, right? For the first time, they, they connected with their elderly neighbor because like the elderly label is so alone. And so now they feel, okay, at least in the day to day, I can drop them like a, a, a bottle of water every day or whatever, like something that really kind of still brings a little bit of day to day meaning. And I saw it with myself, like to me, it's usually then like the, the couple of near-death experiences I had in my life, like usually were very strong kind of like reorientations towards what I find really meaningful. Because I remember my first kind of real near-death experience was uh, when I was 18. I, you know, before that I was this reckless teenager who I was kicked out of school. I had to repeat a year. I was the nightmare of a parent you can imagine. And I transferred this into my driving style. And uh, I, I one day kind of smashed uh, four parked cars, all completely smashed, including my own. And I will not forget the policeman who came to the scene and was like, oh my God, he's still alive. So this idea that I was supposed to be dead. And you know, I asked myself a lot of weird questions like who would have come to my funeral? Was it or worth it? Did it do anything meaningful? And it was depressing to think about it because at that point I had to say, no, not really, not that much meaningful. And so that really set me on this kind of intense search for meaning that I referred to earlier in terms of trying to figure out like what is life really about? And if I run in front of a car tomorrow, was it really worth it? And you know, I've had a lot of conversations with people who had similar experiences and I always love these. There's a, those of you who are interested, they, there's this, this um, uh, I think if you Google probably something like deathbed regrets um, mm -hmm. nurses or something, it should come up where they ask nurses, what is the top deathbed regrets of people? And a lot, you know, nobody ever said my top deathbed regret is that I didn't have five cars in front of, in, instead of like, like four cars, right? They usually say, I wish they had lived like a more meaningful life in terms of like stronger relationships with the people I care about or whatever meaning means for the respective person. And, you know, to me, that was a big reminder again this year to, to really kind of refocus again, because I think we get caught up in like our day to day and how important everything is. But you know what, like once you face death, like things don't really matter that much. And so it's really kind of um, that revaluation I, I've, I've usually kind of gained from these near-death experiences. But I feel this is why I'm such a big kind of um, fan of the idea of reframing and really saying, how do we leverage those situations and, and really try to make the best out of it? And, and Viktor Frankl really, you know, his, his point was always about saying, we can't always control the situation, but we can control our response to it. And if we control our response to it in a way that, 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 that uses us to, to, to develop our own kind of meaning around this, then essentially that's where our agency comes from. That's where our liberty comes from. And in a way that's a lot of times where serendipity comes from. And I think that's kind of um, what, what to me, those, those experiences have uh, you know, brought a lot of times. What a story, especially the car accident one. And then your life turned around at that time, Christian. Did you become a good boy to your parents after this? You know, it's interesting. My so my school friends, whenever I meet them, they still say, like, Christian, we don't recognize you. Like from you know, you you used to be this rebel kid and like now you're kind of this nerdy guy who's like going around and like, you know, uh, doing doing his nerdy stuff. And and you know, it 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 was interesting because I remember the time, right? After that car crash, it was that time where I started applying to a lot of universities and because my high school certificate was was crap, right? It was so bad, like you can't even imagine. I did a lot of kind of extracurricular kind of like like performance type things just to have something on the CV, right? But like I, I wrote over 40 applications and you know, that was back in the days when you still had to like actually send the letters through the mail and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, um, that always reminds me like how, how fast time flies, right? But it's kind of um, the, the um, you know, out of those, like it was very few that actually got back and said, okay, hey, like here's, here's something you can do. But that kind of like was the start of saying, okay, I want to make the best out of this now. Um, I come from a kind of, you know, I was put into this world in a relatively privileged environment. And so I might as well do something with it versus, you know, wasting it with just kind of like living into the day. And so it was quite a, quite a changing point. Yeah. It seems like it was not only a life turning event to you, but also to some of the people around you who, who saw you going through this and saw the change in you as well. So we are coming unfortunately, to the end of our conversation, Christian, and we'd like to ask you anything you would like to share with your audience on Thrive that you haven't shared before on any other podcast or interview. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, almost like a call for collaborations also, because I'm 
uh, you know, at the moment with the book and with kind of like the activities around the book, I'm experimenting a lot, like what are the kind of different areas of application in terms of, you know, is it going deeper into the psychology of how we can reframe anxiety into uh, something else using a serendipity mindset, you know, kind of uncertainty from threat to, to an ally or how we can, you know, um, go deeper into companies and, you know, work around HR processes in terms of how do we recruit people who either already have a bit of that mindset or how we can train people in that mindset. But I think, you know, the big picture is to say, when looking back in 10 years from now to really be able to say, hey, we really kind of like took that mindset and brought it into many, as many contexts, you know, being that universities, being that companies, being that communities as possible as kind of a major way to really, in a way, give give that that joy of life back, right? Because I feel like in a world, you know, that is so fast changing where we, you know, I come from Germany, like I was trained in like planning and strategy and everything else. And then the world happens, you're like, oh my God, like nothing I thought about the world is actually still true, right? Because everything is changing okay. and, and so on. And so really building that muscle for being ready for the unexpected and making the best out of it i feel like a lot of purpose behind that and so i i feel um you know i'm it's, it's an open invitation to essentially also to to your viewers to say if you feel there's some kind of opportunity to connect dots together um i'm i'm very open to that and um via you know linkedin twitter or so to connect and to really develop that uh, further christian what is your username on linkedin so that people can reach out to you on LinkedIn, it's uh, Christian Bush. Um, and then on Twitter, it's at Chris Serendip. At Chris Serendipity. And people can reach out to you on Twitter through your website as well. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I can speak with you for days, Christian. I hope I can have you again on Thrive sometime soon. For people watching us, if you're enjoying this conversation I'm having with Christian, please subscribe to the YouTube channel comment on the video. Remember to check Christian's website, theserendipitymindset.com, where you will find links to his book and also his latest tweets. Until we meet next time, keep safe, keep motivated, keep resilient, and see you in the next episode of Thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much.